All right, this is our lecture for the painting class on light logic and how we use light logic to develop volume within the form. And even something as complex as this painting right here that you're looking at is really just, um, if you were to separate it out, you would just be having the same sections of light logic over and over and over again. There's just lots of little pieces of it. And so the complexity of it is just in the amount of detail and the amount of times you go from light to shadow, light to shadow, light to shadow, and so on. Um, but it's basically, if you can understand the real concept of light logic and how it helps you create volume, then you can continue to expand and expand on it until you come up with a really complex and beautiful image if that's what you would like to do. The very first thing that we do when we look at our simple objects, such as a sphere, a cone, um, a cylinder, like we've got here, not in that order, <laughs> a, sphere, a, a, blah, a sphere, a cylinder, and a cone is what we have, um, is that we look at what part is actually being hit by the light rays. Light rays in the normal world are straight. And so as they go past the object, whenever they hit the widest point of the object, they stop hitting it. It's not like they wrap around and they hit the backside of the object and create a secondary bright light over here. If there is another light that's coming in on the side of the object once you get past the widest point, then it's either a secondary light source or it's reflected light. Either way, you don't want to give it the same importance usually as what you give the main light source because then you really... Um, take away from that feeling of volume you're trying to create. There are lots of different ne different definitions for the parts of light that we talk about. Um, there are some kind of standard definitions that a lot of people use, but I've seen all kinds of different ways of separating out these sections of light. I'm going to tell you that I basically use six different terms um, pretty regularly. Three within the light side and three within the shadow side. So instead of center light, I just use light mass to, be, to mean the main part of the light mass. I use highlight for where there's a reflection of the light. And half tone, and that's where the light mass is turning away and starting to get to the widest point where it's going to disappear. Um, I don't use terminator normally. You do hear that more like in cinematic terms because it's basically the point where light terminates. And so it's kind of this edge. I do use core shadow. I don't call it core of shadow. I just call it the core shadow. And that's this section over here, which is basically the shadow that happens right after that widest point of the volume. I use um, cast shadow for the area that's being cast into shadow by the object, blocking light from hitting it. And then I use reflected light for the areas within the form or within the cast shadow where light is being bounced back in and brightening it again. Um, we talk a little bit about the occlusion shadow. A lot of times I just call it the pit shadow because it's just easier to remember for a lot of people. Uh, but it's basically the part where the object touches either the ground plane or another object and stops any light. It occludes the light from being able to reflect back and forth. If you think of those straight rays of light, they come back, they bounce, they bounce back up, they bounce back up, and they slowly disappear. And that's why we see the shadow get deeper as it wraps around because there's less reflection of light happening there. The light only reflects so far and then it loses the power to continue reflecting. Um, I don't normally call this a sunlight. This area I normally refer to as the ground plane. And then it's just whether or not the ground plane is in shadow or it's in light. As we look at these complex areas, or these simple areas right here, we can apply them to a complex form like the head. So you can see overall that the head is actually a sphere and that it's got kind of a cone shape here for the nose. It's got another sphere for the chin, small spheres basically in different places within the um, shape of the head. Um, a wider turn here, which is probably a little bit more similar to a cylinder. Uh, the neck is like a cylinder with a cast shadow on it. So all we're doing is taking these areas that we've already talked about and applying them to the complexity of the form, whatever that might be. And these same areas, it doesn't matter if you're talking about a single grape or an entire bunch of grapes, they apply. It's just how much they repeat through the object and how they interact with each other. So let's go through the six areas I mentioned and kind of define them a little bit better. And they each have some different things that they add to the equation as far as the painting. The highlight is your lightest value and it's the most intense area of light. It's at the crest of the form facing the light source. Um, it's typically a value 1, which for me I use a value 1 through 10 scale normally when I'm, when I'm referring to things and a 1 is a white. 
okay? So it's typically a value one or one and a half. And the reason that it is is because the highlight is actually a reflection of your light source. So you don't see the color of the object in a real highlight. You just see the reflection of the light source there. So it's usually a one or a one and a half. Even when that highlight is on something really dark like blue or black, the highlight itself will be a one or a one and a half. The edges and sharpness of the highlight are determined by the surface quality of the object, whether it's matte, glossy, transparent, and so on. On a very soft matte surface, and the example I always, I always use is like if you had a velvet Christmas ball um, and you were to shine a light on it, you might not have any reflection of light on that at all because it's very matte. It's a very soft surface that soaks in and doesn't really do any reflection. The highlight moves as it goes around the form wherever you are in relationship to the light source. So if you're sitting closer to the light source, you're going to find that the highlight's over here. If you're sitting farther away from the light source, you're going to find that the highlight moves over here. It's basically created, it's an equal angle on either side that's created between you, the object, and the light source. And the reason I mention that is because if your seat shifts slightly and you realize that now that the painted highlight that you did in one part of your cup is now in another part of the cup, that's because you you or the light source or the object have moved positions. Usually it's you, just to be honest with you, it's usually you, and that you need to move a little bit. So you'll want to check other things within your painting um, before you get started and just make sure that they all line up um, correctly and that your light source is in the same place. There are a couple things I like about this image. It's just a photo of a cue ball, but one of the things is a really clear representation of that bright highlight. This is something that you would probably think of as a white or cream colored ball, but if you actually looked at it, you'd notice this is quite a bit brighter. And this is a white surface out here, the way we would define it, but you notice this highlight is quite a bit brighter. So this is one of the things I want you to start doing as you move through your day is just notice the values like really open your eyes and observe what you're seeing the differences are between like where the light is brighter and where it's not so bright start noticing these things the more observant you are the better of a painter and artist you can be the light mass is basically the broad intermediate values between the highlight and the halftone area of the form. So it's the main part of the object that's in light. As it transitions to the halftone, somewhere within that light mass area is where you actually see the strongest pigmentation of the form. And it really depends on a couple things. So first off, it depends on um, how translucent your surface is, like if it's skin tone. Um, skin is actually layers of like fat and tissue and it soaks up some of the light and then reflects other parts of the light, especially depending on how much um, melanin, mel uh, you know, dark pigment you have in your skin. Um, whichever one that is, I can't remember. So you want to pay attention to that. Also, um, you might notice that like darker objects feel much closer to their true color when they get into the half tone area, whereas lighter ones, you might be able to read the color better up in the bright part of the light mass because it's a little bit more lit up. Um, remember that as the light mass turns into the shadow, it's not lighting up that color anymore. So what you're seeing as color, you're seeing it somewhat, but you're also interpreting it as that color just because your brain is interpreting it for you. This kind of gives an example of how the form turns and how uh, immediately when the light hits the form it's at a perpendicular angle and it's reflecting back more strongly. As it becomes less perpendicular and more parallel it skims the surface instead of reflecting back so brightly. And so that skimming helps to actually allow you to see the true color of the form. It's less reflective and so you see a little bit more of the color of the form. The half tone is the area right before it goes into shadow. It's the last portions of the light side of the object. Um, it's the strongest area of pigmentation in a lot of transparent or translucent objects such as skin. The edge and the quickness of the transition of the half tone is determined by how round or sharp the turn is. And by that I mean like if it's a cube, you're going to not have any half tone maybe. Okay, but if it's a sphere, a small sphere, it's going to be a shorter half tone area. And if it's a big sphere, it's going to be a broader half tone area. 
Okay, and the biggest, the best way of explaining this is if you think of size, it's think about when the sun's setting and then the sun starts to set and it's right on the horizon and everything's kind of cast in that half light, but there's still a little bit of light hitting, but it's all kind of cast in that half light. You're basically in the half tone area of our earth at that moment. Um, so this is just kind of showing that same slide again, but referring to the half tone. You can see here we've reached where the um, form turns and it's no longer going to be hit by the light source because these light rays go straight, so they're not going to hit this angle. So this is our half tone area. The core shadow and then the terminator, which is the edge of the core shadow, um, is the shadow that begins at the widest part of the form as it rolls away from the light side. The core shadow does a wonderful job of conveying a sense of volume to the form. So a lot of times when you look at a form and it feels kind of flat, if you've been painting and it feels a little bit flat, like it doesn't feel like it's round enough, it might be that you need to deepen your core shadow a little bit. It describes the roundness of a turn just like the half tone does as well because the core shadow will either be finer and smaller, not as wide, or it'll be really broad as it goes around. The deepest area, it's the deepest area of shadow within the form itself, basically within the main form of the, um, of the object um, for a couple reasons. One is that just it makes sense and it's a fact that it's the furthest usually from any reflected light of the ground plane. So it's deeper shadow because it doesn't have as much reflected light into it. But the other reason that the core shadow feels dark is because it's of its relationship. It's the closest shadow to the light side of the form. So it appears darker because of that. This is an example of a core shadow. So you can see how the core shadow kind of fades out down here and we get more reflected light because this part of the sphere is closer to the light source. The core shadow is not typically the same little dark ring all the way around. It's not like um, uh, Jupiter or whatever, Saturn with rings around it, okay, that are evenly all the way around it. it just It's just at this wider part as it comes out to the viewer. Okay, and it might wrap up a little bit up here, but normally it gets a little bit darker as it comes out to the viewer. Here's some photographs that show you really well that core shadow, how it disappears when there's more reflected light. It's disappearing here because there's kind of back reflected light. It's deeper here where it's coming towards the viewer. It's deeper here as it comes towards us as the viewer. Yes, it's still deep back here because this part of the object, not this part right behind it, but if you were to go straight out from the sphere behind it, there's probably no um, plane here that's reflecting light back into it. But down here there is. And then you can see on here that we don't necessarily have the same idea of a core shadow as we do on a round object, but if we push this shadow up at the front edge, it, which is basically what we're going to want to do here, it's going to create more contrast to the light side and it's going to help pop this corner forward to us as we're painting. The reflected light is caused by secondary or later reflection of light from another surface or from within the form itself. So it's never as strong in value as the surface reflecting the light. And you basically want to think of it as like the light hits the main surface, it's at its top power. Let's say it's at power 100. As it hits the surface and reflects back in, it's reflecting back in at maybe 40%. Okay, so it's only going to hit 40% back into that object. Then it's going to hit back into the shadow that's being cast by that, that object on the ground. It's going to be maybe at 5 or 10, well, like 10 or 20%, and then it's going to hit back up into the object again at like 5%. So you see it can quickly lose its power as it bounces back and forth, which is why we see this slow fade of the reflected light going away. Um, it's never as strong as value as the surface reflecting the light, which also means that you need to l take down your values. So let's say that this is our light area of the object. When we have a reflected light bouncing back, oh wait, we got to go to the next one. Sorry, I can see it. You can't. I'll go to it in a minute. When there's a strong reflected light, remember that brightening the light in your painting is not always, the reflected light in your painting is not always the answer. Um, a lot of times it's the fact that you need to darken the shadows around it and then all of a sudden your reflected light will appear brighter. But m many times with beginning painters what they do is they brighten that reflected light because it doesn't feel bright enough and they keep brightening it and before they realize they've got it at the same value as the actual light part of their form which is a conflicting view for us looking at the painting. 
We want to keep it contained within the shadow side of the form by carefully analyzing the value and rooting it in those shadow values. And I'll explain a little bit more what I mean by that in a little bit. So this is the image I was looking at that you couldn't see. So you can kind of see how the light hits the form here, how bright it is. And then it hits down here on this light um, surface of the um, ball is sitting on it bounces back in. Is it anywhere near this volume of light up here? Absolutely not. It's much darker. And if we actually pull this value right here in the half tone and compare it to this value, this is probably what you think looks brighter, but in reality this is brighter. So it's all kind of a relationship thing, right? I might be really happy, but if I'm next to somebody who's like ecstatically happy, I might seem kind of sad or like a downer. Not really that fun for the group, right? But on the other hand, if I'm around somebody who's more quiet than I am, then I might appear very effusive and excited. So it's about that relationship of what you're next to. And that's what happens with light. This right here is a light that's next to a really bright light, so it appears darker than it is. Whereas this right here is a light that's surrounded by all kinds of shadows, especially very deep shadows, so it appears um, lighter than it actually is. The cast shadow is when the, another form blocks the shadow from casting on a plane. It can be outside the form or within the form itself, like rolls of, rolls of drapery. Um, but no, mostly I just want to, I want you guys to think about it's where you've got an object blocking light from hitting something else. Okay. It's not that the object turned and that's the widest part, but it's actually blocking the light. It's casting that shadow on the, ob on the other object or, or plane. It has sharper edges as it's closer to the form that's causing it. It's usually deeper in value than the core shadow of the form. So it's a darker value normally. Deeper shadows closest to the form where that occlusion shadow is, but you want to watch for reflected light from within from the form itself. When that light bounces back and forth from the ground plane to the sphere, it can sometimes brighten up that cast shadow for a little bit right at the, near the base of the form. As the cast shadow moves away from the form, the edges become softer and sometimes the value lightens as atmospheric light begins to influence it. Cast shadow is a careful representative of the shape of the form first off, and by that I mean a teapot doesn't cast a square shadow. It casts a shadow that relates to its edges as well. So it helps tell our viewers, it's a secondary way of telling our viewers what the shape of that form actually is in space. And it also helps build a sense of the relationship to the ground plane and a sense of atmosphere and space. So if you have a flat ground plane, the cast shadow is going to be very delineated. It's going to reflect very much that object of the form. On the other hand, if you have rolls of drapery, the cast shadow is going to bend and fold over those rolls of drapery. So it helps give us a feeling that the ground plane also is not flat, if that makes sense. By, and the, what I mean by it creating a sense of atmosphere and space is here we've got three objects with simple light. They're just kind of floating in that white space. And then here we have those same three objects, but now all of a sudden we've got a feeling of where they reside in space, that there is some form sitting underneath them, a plane of some sort. Um, we get a feeling like, are they on top of a hill or are they on something flat? No, we know they're on something flat and so on. Um, this is just kind of showing you different angles. So if you take a perspective course within perspective, you'll actually learn a bit about drawing the perspective of shadows. I don't need you to know this for the class, but it's helpful to understand that the cast shadow is going to change depending on where your light source is and where you are at. Okay, if you're around the back side of an object, it's going to be coming at you. If you're around the side of an object, it's going to be going to one side or the other side and so on. So to be aware of that. Um, this is kind of that idea of atmosphere and space. So we don't know, like maybe this person is standing on a hill and they're way in front of the tree and the tree is actually really big or maybe the hill, the the tree is on a hill, or maybe they just haven't crossed in front of the tree yet. I don't really know. But as we put these shadows in, now all of a sudden we have a feeling of how these objects relate to each other and what this actual space is. Even without anything else being in there, all we've put are the shadows. Um, this is kind of a description of how the cast shadow 
changes. And it's very delineated within this image, but it's not this delineated in real life, trust me. Um, but you will notice that parts of the cast shadow might be deeper as they're closer to the form, and we would refer to that as the umbra, and you will never hear me use these terms in class, so don't worry about remembering them. I can't even say the last one very well, antimbrambra. <laughs> And then the penumbra is kind of this mid-value area, and then this whatever it is at the end. But one of the things that's helpful is to see how that shadow stretches out when the light source, depending on the light source, and how the edges get softer. Okay, and then these are just more descriptors of that cast shadow, how it stretches out. You can see how when it's close to the object, it's very defined and much evenly, uh, much more even with the values and dark. Here as it stretches out, it feels darker here and softer as it goes away. Um, cast shadows, especially with multiple light sources, can be really problematic, so it's important to observe them very carefully when you're not mapping out the perspective if you want them to feel realistic. And again, just another descriptor of that. Okay, so these next images are basically just showing how we would block through things. And this is, again, this is a charcoal drawing, um, but it really does a nice job of showing the process of how we simplify our forms initially. We're going to block out our shadow side, and I'll do some demos for this as well. Um, and it's a very simple drawing at this point. There's not a lot of descriptive lines. There's not a strong representation of the different shapes of the details and so on. But as we start developing the drawing overall, we start coming into a more resolved contour line. We get a better sense of the value changes within the shadow side as well as within the light side. And as we come into this final shape right here, you can see the difference in how the shadows are really delicately um, developed and as well as the light side and how there's a stronger light area within this shape that's repeated throughout but it's a little bit softer as it gets further from the light source. Let's look at some photos for a minute and just kind of see how light acts in some of these cases again. You can see that some of these reflected lights actually feel very bright and that you might feel very inclined when you're painting to brighten them up and brighten them up. But you can notice how different this value is here from the values within the light side. Even the halftone areas, if you really look, are are brighter than these areas of reflected light in this object. So this is kind of what I'm talking about with ordering our values and with figuring out our value scale. Of, and I'll describe that more in just a minute. We're almost to that. And this is a really great descriptor for showing the different areas of light and shadows. You can see half tones as the form rolls into shadow. You can see cast shadows where the lip is blocking the light from hitting this lower part of the chin and cast shadow right here, but then form shadow in this top part. So as the form rolls over, hits the widest part, it stops being touched by the light source. We get reflected light. Here's our core shadow right here along the edge. And then as we get to the edge of the reflected light, you can see here we've got cast shadow. And you can see the difference in value between the cast shadow and the core shadow area. Again, all these complex forms in these next few slides are basically just the repetition of light logic and being very, very careful about controlling your values. So let's look at the 10-step grayscale for just a minute. And there's a couple things I want you to understand. You're going to be doing this as an exercise for the class before you do your painting. Um, you have one is a white, and then two, three, four, and so on, all the way down to 10 is a black. And there are some things about this value scale that I don't particularly care for. It's, it's got, um, it could have a little bit more spread here in the middle and maybe another, um, like maybe even get rid of like one of these here. I don't know. It just feels a little bit too close in some areas and too far in other areas. Um, but one of the things that's really nice about this, I'll describe a little bit more what I'm talking about when I do the palette demo for you. Um, but one of the things that's very nice is this really shows you how you can take a middle value, like a number six value, and you can put it against a one or a two, and it looks really dark. 
If you weren't to look at the rest of this, you might think this is more like an 8 or a 9. But if you take this very same value chip and put it against a black, it looks really light. And this is kind of what I'm talking about with your reflected light. Let's say this was your reflected light and your shadow was only this dark. It wouldn't appear very bright. And so sometimes you might keep brightening this, but if you brighten it too quickly, you're going to go up into these light values, right? But if you take the same thing and you darken the shadows around it a little bit darker, it all of a sudden makes your reflected light feel a lot brighter. So the way we use this value scale, I'm going to kind of demonstrate quickly, and then I'll explain it more with the palettes, is um, within this these diagrams from the internet. So they're using a 1 through a 9 scale on this, but it basically relates almost the same. And they're kind of showing how 1, 2, and 3 values are here and how um, the shadow side of the form is basically 6 through 9, with 6 being the reflected light, 7 being our core shadow, um, 9 and 8 and 7 being our cast shadow here. So you can kind of see that if you were to develop a range, you would say my light side is 1 through 3. You maybe even have a 4 or a 5 when we start looking at like some of these other things, but 1 through 3 is our light side, and 7 through 9 is our shadow side, and we shouldn't go any, or 6 through 9 is our shadow side, and we shouldn't go any brighter than a 6 on our shadow side. So if we develop a palette that reflects these same numbers, except we're just going to go 1 through 10 for the logic of it all, if we develop a palette that has ten, a 10 step grayscale on it, and then we know we can't go any brighter than this for our, than our, for our, bleh, excuse me, for our reflected light at number six, then all we got to do is go in and hit our reflected light with a six. If that's too bright, we can make it a little darker if we need to. But more than likely, as we start developing things, we'll find that that's it. That's our range. And so I really suggest as you guys are getting started with these, before you start painting, what you're doing, do a sketch and start figuring out, like actually go in your sketchbook or your drawing pad, whatever you're drawing on, and figure out what you think your value scales are. These are just simple white objects that are going one through five and then six through nine. You might have a colored object that maybe it's brightest light minus the highlight. The highlight we said is always a one or a one and a half if it's got it. So maybe it's brightest light is more, it's a blue. And so say it's more like a four. So maybe its light side is only a 4 through a 5 or a 4 through a 6, and then the shadow side is a 6 through a 9. Okay, so but determining those value scales for your different objects will really help you make a little bit more sense and keep your shadow and your light side separate from each other, which really helps create a sense of volume. This is just kind of showing how different it can look depending on how you light something. Um, and then let's just kind of look. These are just some more photos of some different objects, and you can go look through these at your own leisure if you want. Um, but you can kind of notice like the reflected lights, and that's what I would say to do is go through some of these and look for reflected lights versus shadow areas. Try and figure out what's in the shadow, what the value ranges, what value ranges you think you might use, and so on. It'll really help you if you can do some practice work like that. And this is a great example right here. This is um, this plane head kind of shows you how um, that um, bust head would actually have turned out if it was just uh, simple chiseled planes instead of all softened. Here's another one right here. It's the plane. It's a death mask basically, and this is the plane form. And you can see how clearly delineated these are. And all you need to do is once you've placed these, I'm sorry, it does sound a little bit by, like a paint by number, but there's a lot of logic behind paint by numbers too and why they work. Okay, so all you do is you take, you block in your values very simply like this, and then you go through and soften the edges where you need them softer, build a little bit more shadow where you need more shadow, soften the edge, maybe it's going to be a little sharper edge in some places, a little softer edge, but you just go through and mess with it, and that's how you get to this. This is showing you the idea of how value relates to color. So remember I said maybe if you had something blue, it's more like a four or a five. Um, so you can kind of see the difference here in like a main color. Depending on your blue, it might be more in one of these values here, depending on what blue you're using. A red might be more in one of these middle values here, and a yellow is much lighter. It's like a light gray. It just feels darker because it's got this bright color. Um, this photograph right here, this is it, broken down into a monochromatic. 
And that's one thing that would actually help you a lot is to take photos of something and then just put a monochrome filter on them and look at them. And then we'll kind of go through some of these. This was an example of taking a colored painting and then um, doing it as a black and white version. And then I did a Xerox um, black and white version of the same color painting to show you how it compares. And then these are student examples. So as you look through these, just look for like the, the highlight areas versus the shadow areas. Um, the light, main light mass, the transparency of what's happening. Notice that some objects appear like they're probably darker colors than other objects. Okay, darker color than this object. Um, it's really important to separate out the values of those different objects so that they read correctly. So you know, oh, okay, this is a darker colored object like a blue or a brown object. It's actually a brown object. And this is a dark blue bottle. And then this is a white plaster nose. It's kind of old and dirty. And this was a newer white plaster. So you want to look for some things like that. You guys are going to have drapery in your paintings as well. These, these images I put in here don't have the drapery in them. But, and then the reflections. Again, remember, reflected light isn't as strong as the initial light source. It might feel very bright when you're looking at it, but you cannot make it the same value as the, as the place that's actually reflecting it. And the same thing happens with reflections or with transparencies. Okay, when you do a reflection, it's a reflection of this ground plane that you're seeing. It should be darker. It shouldn't be as bright as this one because it's a secondary um, generation, basically, of that object. On a transparent object, if something goes behind it, it should get darker as it goes behind it. That's not the best example because it's already kind of 